Hi everyone, this is the first in a series of short talks about The Tempest and we're going to begin by discussing the context of the play and how it works when you start to compare it as you have to do for your HSC with Margaret Atwood's book, Hagsey. Now as you probably know, The Tempest was written in 1611 and it's widely supposed to be Shakespeare's last complete play written by him as an individual. There's quite a bit of mythology around this idea. He died two years after he wrote it. In fact, he did go on writing plays, collaborating with other people um, after he'd written The Tempest. But one of the reasons we probably mythologise it and like the idea that he was saying some sort of farewell to us is that Prospero, the main character, is saying farewell a lot of the time throughout the play. Shakespeare has invented a very dramatic opening. This is a play about magic. It's set on a magical island. It begins with this tumult of a wild storm. And as you know, in Shakespeare's time, disturbance in nature means that there's disturbance in the world order, disturbance in the characters, disturbance in what is going on in the universe and that things are being shaken up and overturned, possibly not what the Almighty wants. So it's a sign of danger. So we open with this wild storm, which we learn very quickly from his daughter Miranda. Prospero has conjured up. Now Prospero is a magus, he's a magician. He's not a magus in, not a magician, in the sense of someone who pulls rabbits out of hats, but rather he is an alchemist, a philosopher, a man of learning, a man of knowledge. And one of the key things to remember about the context of this play is that it's written in a pre-scientific era. So whereas today we look for evidence and we deduce information and facts from that, at the time that this was written there was still quite a strong belief in superstition. People did believe that the stars could control what you do. Even Shakespeare, a well-educated man, has a curse on his tombstone which is intended to put grave robbers off. So there were the, the idea that there were fairies that made your milk go bad, for example, or spirits that could get into your house down the chimney and then do no good. This was quite widely believed and the idea behind the character of Prospero is that he is somebody who is much more akin to a modern day philosopher and scientist somebody who is trying to or studying or learning the way that the world works. But he can do magic, he has conjured up this storm. Importantly, note that there are limits to his power. He can't make people fall in love. Um, as we know, he had given his role as Duke away to his brother to become the caretaker and his brother formed an alliance with the neighbouring state and together they got rid of Prospero, they set him afloat in a leaky boat in the hope that he would die and never be seen of again and Prospero's magic was unable to stop that. So he's not absolutely totally powerful but he certainly does have control of some magic arts. If we compare this to the context in which Hagseed is written, we are talking about a modern 21st century secular society where while a lot of people believe in a Christian God, a lot of people don't. And the um, magic, which we also see in The Tempest, takes place in the theatre. So in The Tempest, we see lots of tricky stage manoeuvres. There's a mask, there's people who disappear and reappear. There are flashes of light, there's music, there are thunderstorms, all of these stage effects. In Hagseed, we have only the theatre to be the place where magic occurs. And this of course taps into one of the major themes, which is um, the role of theatre and the importance of theatre in our lives today. Margaret Atwood wrote this book as a commission. Uh, it was the Hogarth Press, which is a quite a highbrow press. Um, it was set up by Virginia and Leonard Wolfe. They may be two names that you know. One of the giant, two of the giants of early 20th century um, writing, British writing and literature and publishing. Um, and the idea was that Shakespeare would be reimagined. And what Margaret Atwood has done is to relocate the story in the present day. Um, she has also 
played with it in a way which means that there are very amusing twists on what Shakespeare originally wrote. And what you need to understand about Margaret Atwood is that she herself is a very serious um, Shakespeare scholar. She had a highly successful academic career, although she knew from the age of 16 that she wanted to be a writer. She was a very accomplished university professor and she knows her stuff. When it comes to the bard, and she's able to play all sorts of deft games and twists, and it's pretty easy for you to see the similarities and the differences, at least at a superficial level, um, between the two texts. So Margaret Atwood's values are that she's a feminist, um, and we do have in The Tempest, in the original, very few female characters. We really only have Miranda. She's the only one on stage who is a female. The other women who are mentioned are Sycorax, the witch, the misshapen and ghastly witch, who is Caliban's mother. And Caliban is only half man, half fish. We're not too sure what Caliban is. Um, and we get a very brief mention of Miranda's mother. And we get a very brief mention of a young woman called Clarabel. And she is the daughter of the King of Naples. And the reason that this ship is passing by and that um, Prospero is able to conjure up a storm and wreck these people and put them in his power is because Clarabel has been married to uh, an African. She's been married to a man who lives in Tunis. That's a big step. Clarabel has been married and must leave her world, her family, uh, she will not be coming back. But her father and brother have gone to see her off and to be present at the marriage. That's a tiny little marriage plot. There is a big marriage plot in The Tempest, and that is the marriage of Miranda to Ferdinand. And one of the powerful themes that we'll be discussing is paternal love. Paternal love is a huge theme in Hagseed because Felix, who is the modernised version of Prospero, and Prospero means what it sounds like, prosperous, good, good fortune. Felix, also felicitas, happiness, joy. So there is a, a connection in the names of the two characters. And Felix is a theatre director, so his magic arts are that he can make drama happen and transform our lives through theatre. He had a daughter, and his daughter Miranda died uh, when she was very young, preschool age. And he has lived with the memory of her. She is literally a face behind glass in a photograph. And in, her mem in, in his memories, she lives on. It's a tragedy that he can't get past. Now, Prospero's daughter Miranda is alive and well and standing in front of him. And some of the most beautiful prose in the play concerns his affection for Miranda. I've done nothing, child, but in care of thee. And it's true. We know that although he is um, a fairly dominating father, he genuinely loves Miranda desperately and is most tender towards her. But she is a woman of marriageable age and at that time the only way for a girl to get married was for her father to choose and endorse the person that she married. And because these are noble and high-born people, he has a, an idea in mind which will aid his broader plan, which is to get revenge. So the guys that did the dirty on him are sailing by in a boat. He conjures up a storm to wreck them on his island. He arranges them so that they land in different spots around the island. Um, his sprite, his spirit, Ariel, who is like his servant, has the magic powers to assist him to do that. And she actually executes the plan and makes sure that everyone is shipwrecked properly. Once he's got them all in place, much as a theatre director would do at the beginning of a play, after that he starts to manoeuvre and to manipulate. But one of the key things he wants to do is to bring Ferdinand into contact with Miranda in the hope that the two of them will fall in love. If they marry, then the two houses that were separated by Prospero's abdication of his dukedom and his brother's usurpation of it will be joined again. So there's a nice symmetry. Prospero is a man of plans. He has everything organised and sketched out before it happens. 
So over in Hackseed, we have a rather different um, version of this. There are actually three Mirandas in Margaret Atwood's novel. There is the woman who plays Miranda in the production of The Tempest, which takes place in the jail, and her name is Anne-Marie Greenland, and she's an actual woman. And then there is the trapped, now dead Miranda behind glass in Felix's memory. And then there's the third one, there is undead Miranda. Because in his grief and sorrow, Felix, who is unable to forgive himself for neglectfully being so busy with his theatre rehearsals that he didn't take the calls that interrupted him to tell him that his daughter was in hospital and was looking as though she wasn't going to last the day, he didn't get to say goodbye to her and can't forgive himself. So he conjures up in from the depths of his depression and his sorrow, there's a make-believe Miranda who lives alongside him. In the case of Shakespeare plays, there is normally uh, an original story of a fictional version somewhere else, another play or a well-known tale, which is the inception of the play. But we don't have that for The Tempest. What we have instead is most likely um, a couple of real-life events. So there was at the time uh, a genuine philosopher king who really did give away his dukedom. Um, and his name was Emperor Rudolf II, and he was known as the Wizard Emperor. Um, I can't actually re remember where he was, but he buried himself with his books, um, and it's, uh, he was really quite happy to go away and, and do his studies and leave the ruling of his land to his brother. I think it was somewhere in Central Europe. Prospero depicts his situation, however, as being the unseating of a lawful authority, and that by going into his study and locking himself away with his books and asking his brother to take care of the shop, that his brother did the wrong thing by taking over. Now, I want to ask you, because I think this is morally questionable, in a world which has a highly ordained, very structured world order, if you've been put in charge of a realm, then God is the person who has done that. If you start messing with God's will and handing the job to somebody else, you're taking a big risk. So there is an argument that by doing what he did, Prospero overturned the natural order and this leaves him vulnerable to the retribution which did indeed come his way and which he is seeking to redress. Over in Hagseed, We've got an equivalent plot where, so immersed in his production of The Tempest, Felix A didn't answer the phone or take the calls when his daughter was dying, but B, the people he worked with were plotting against him and getting ready to knife him in the back. I should say, Felix is an awful pain in the neck. Um, he's peremptory, he's demanding, he wants everything, he's very self-important, and he just didn't see it coming when they decided that he was going too far, spending too much money, alienating the theatre goers. It wasn't working and he was absolutely shocked when he lost his job. And now, years later, 12 years later, he is racked with shame and guilt. He is so embarrassed that he did this, that what he does is maroon himself on an island. So while Prospero and his little girl were put to sea in an open boat, Felix goes for a long drive and finds a deserted shack in which he can live all by himself. He changes his name, he goes by a false name, and he takes a job working as a Shakespeare producer in a prison. And the fact that it's a prison speaks to the context. Atwood has a strong belief in social justice, um, she's left-leaning and the idea of people being treated equally is very important to her. So let's zigzag that one back because another important theme which is introduced early in the play is the idea of colonialism. When Shakespeare wrote this play, it was an age of exploration. Elizabeth I, um, the Spanish Kingdom and James I also were putting to sea and looking for new territories and they were finding amazing things. 
One of the things which was definitely known to Shakespeare and a real life event, which almost certainly is a spark to the setting for The Tempest, is the wreck of a ship called the Sea Venture. Um, it went to sea and was wrecked in Bermuda, which is an island, Caribbean island, so we're talking luscious landscape, um, beautiful tropical surroundings. And unlike um, many shipwrecks, everybody did not perish, indeed. They managed to survive and a year after they'd been marooned on this island, they were rescued. And the captain wrote an account of it and Shakespeare almost certainly would have read it. So the details of what was out there were known to him. Probably by this time people didn't really believe that if you got to the edge of the world you fell off. Um, and they were intrigued and excited by these new worlds that they were discovering. So over to Hagseed, we have not got an equivalent to that. We've got a kind of an inversion of it, which is that the island is an island which is a prison. And not everybody can get access to that island. You have to have a reason to go there. Um, either because you're a convicted criminal or because you're visiting one or because in the case of Felix, you actually work there. So it's sequestered from mainstream society um, but and certain people can come and go from it but not everybody. By the time um, we get to the opening of the two stories, we see that the structure of the two of them diverges a little bit. Um, we find that the um, opening storm, which we see in The Tempest, is mirrored in Hagseed by a performance of The Tempest, which is, in fact, going to take place a lot later. So in both cases, there's a little bit of messing around with time. We call that in media res, in the middle of things. Act one, scene two, is where Prospero sits Miranda down and tells her their backstory and explains all of what I've just said to you, is explained to her. So she has lived 12 uh, years with him on this island without really knowing why they're there. And in the case of Hagseed, we get that presented to us in a slightly different way um, in the opening, which is called Dark Backwood. Atwood has cleverly constructed five parts to her story which mirror the five acts of the Shakespeare play and each of the five parts is named uh, after or uses a line from The Tempest as its chapter title. Um, so colonialism in the Elizabethan and Jacobian times is mirrored by the preoccupation with the damage done to First Nations people when um, empires were built in the 17th, 18th and 19th century. And so in Canada, as in Australia, um, as in America, great concern for the people who were oppressed and pushed aside when somebody like Prospero just landed on the island and took it over. So although there is not a direct parallel, there was certainly concern during the time Shakespeare was writing about what was right and whether the people who you discovered when you went to a new land, because this had started happening, what relationship did you have with them? Whose place was it? Could you use it? Could you use them? These are important ethical concerns which are um, evident in Shakespeare's play and he was heavily influenced by the writings of Montaigne. And the other term that we need to mention is Christian humanism. Humanism is a concern with mankind, humankind. And the idea that God, who previously would have been seen as the director, who, who it's called providentialism or determinism, the idea that God has a path for you and you will travel that path no matter what you do. This is for many hundreds of years been felt a bit unsatisfactory because if it's already a foregone conclusion whether you're going to wind up in heaven or you're going to wind up in hell, and everybody believed that, then w what does it matter? What, how, how can you do bad or do good if the conclusion is already foregone? What is the point? So this gives rise to the awareness 
that we have free will and that we can make choices. And if we make a choice which violates heaven's hopes or plans or intentions for us, then we might cop it and wind up in hell. And it's possibly this which Prospero realises he may have done. Over in Hagseed, in modern society, we see the same issue being aired as concern for the disenfranchised people, the people who can't, the prisoners, um, the people who don't have free will. They've had their free will taken away from them. And the idea of humanism being that we need to care for people as individuals, we need to care for their humanity, and that we should all, this is apparent in both texts, that we should all treat each other with kindness, with compassion, that we should be fair, and that we should be reasonable. And the role of reason plays a very important part in The Tempest. And here, the idea for you to be aware of is that reason should be interposed between impulse and emotion and action. If the actions that you have the impulse to take are damaging. So the reason that Prospero is offside with Caliban, having loved him and been kind to him, he has then withdrawn his love and kindness and in fact tortures Caliban, is because Caliban attempted to rape Miranda. He did not stop his more base impulses. And in this, he was animal-like. He gave in to his instincts, to his impulses. Whereas, according to the Christian humanist ethos, what he should have done was understand that that would be harmful to Miranda and he would stop himself and he would behave in a noble and proper way. Humanism in the 21st century is seen much more through a wish to be kind and fair and to give prisoners the chance to rehabilitate themselves and go out into the world and lead a fresh life. Um, we'll leave it there for now and we'll start talking about the text of the two stories in the next presentation. <laughs>